Fisherman Peter Maki says, Salt Strong raises the bar again. This is unparalleled in the fishing and boating world. I appreciate all the work invested in this Smart Fishing Spots app. Angler Neil Haygood says, Thanks for what looks to be an awesome Swiss Army knife of fishing apps. Guys, Joe Simons here with Salt Strong. If you haven't checked out the Smart Fishing Spots app and software, what the heck are you waiting on? This is next level. It is the all-in-one app. Has everything from radar and sonar and tides and wind and weather and this underwater 3D charts. It is absolutely amazing for tracking all of your trips and predicting the best time and tide and time of day to go out there and catch inshore slams. It is all there in the Smart Fishing Spots app. And the best news is it's completely for free for our Insider members. So if you've been on the fence, I hope this is what takes you over the edge. Come join us at saltstrong.com. You'll see a button to join us. For you current members, thank you guys so much. We have a whole lot more coming. Here's the episode. It's fishing, it's in my soul. Welcome to the Salt Strong Podcast, disrupting fishing entertainment as you know it. Prepare to laugh. Prepare to get to know fishing legends in a whole new and unfiltered way. And on occasion, you might even learn a thing or two about fishing. Here's your host, Joe Simons, like diamonds. Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simons, like diamonds, back again. We're talking about flounder fluke. And we have the man, the myth, the fluke fishing legend, John Skinner himself. John, welcome back. I think this might be a three-peat for the podcast, certainly a new record. Yeah, that's about right. I can recall sitting in my uh, truck on lunch hours when I was working, doing a couple of podcasts. So uh, absolutely, yeah. (laughs) And so not working now? What's retirement like? Just fishing all the time, huh? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's pretty much nonstop. Fishing and then, you know, fishing related uh, business things. But um, yeah, no more writing software. Yeah, no, that's enough of that. Yeah. So, and where are you now? I know you spend half the year up north and half of it down in Florida. I oh, yeah, I'm, no, I'm north. I mean, I, I got to tell you, when I leave Florida in the first week of May, I don't know how you guys live down there 12 months of the year because at that point, it starts getting really warm and really uncomfortable for this northerner. And the noceums and everything else, and the humidity, and uh, yeah, I'm so happy to drive north in that first week of May. And so then I'm I'm here, and it's it's nice because then I get up here, and when I go fishing in the morning, it's like 50 degrees out, and you know the water is only a little warmer than that. So it's it's quite a change, and it's nice. Yeah, so I'm out on the east end of Long Island. Cool. Well, that uh, that does sound nice. There's been a few days here recently that have uh, been approaching 100 and just that humidity's back and uh, doggone. Kind of wish I, uh, I had that, but I digress. We got a request from Fishing Rod Rice, one of our Insider members. And if you're watching this, we're actually in the community, in our Insider community. And uh, this is kind of what it looks like. This is just his question here. And you can see some comments down below. And I'll read it for those of you who are listening to the podcast. And so it's this podcast request, the three flounder species, knowing the differences. I would like to request a future podcast, which is happening presently. The three different flounder species, knowing the difference, the identification of Gulf, Gulf Southern and Summer, a.k.a. Fluke up north, migration patterns, locations during the different seasons, and best lures. I know Salt Strong offers the Floundering Mastery Course with John Skinner, but I thought this would be a great tease. Plus, if you can get the man on here, I'd love to hear his story. So, sent John a text. He says, I'm all in. And now, for the next however many minutes we're going to do this, we're going to be talking about Flounder and Fluke. So, where do you want to begin? Do you, I know you obviously have a preference in uh, the, the type that you catch because they get a lot bigger. And, uh, and you've perfected it. So do you want to start there with your fluke up north? Yeah, absolutely. So when I get here in uh, the, that first week of May, the fluke, which are really, you know, those are the summer flounder. That's all we have here, our summer flounder. We don't have the, the gulf, obviously, and we don't have the southern. Um, so, yeah, they're just about coming in at that point. They spend their winter uh, well offshore uh, in the ocean, I believe, at the continental shelf around that area. They spawn out there, actually, and then they start working their way in. So when I'm here the first week of May, the water temperature is about 50. You know, they're just starting to show up. And 
Uh, you don't really have a, a good ocean fishery at that point. They go into the bays. Like, so I live out on the uh, east end of the North Fork of Long Island, and the water between the forks is like Peconic Bay, Shelter Island Sound. And it's a, you know, a big body of water. And that's where we get the first, uh, that's where we target them early on is uh, in those waters. And um, as things warm up, what happens, and this starts happening right around now, sometime in June, as those bay waters start getting well up into the 70s, um, those fish will vacate those bays for the season. They will not come back. I mean, we have a, you know, a, a spring run of fluke inside these bays but we don't have a fall run so um what will happen is the fishing will then shift over to the ocean at that point we'll be fishing a lot off of like montauk block island but that fishery is is good all along um the south shore of long island on the ocean side and um, down to new jersey however you know as i say that we don't have um much in the way of a fishery in like the peconic bay system during the summer and, and beyond, um, what happens is the bays behind the barrier islands, the ocean barrier islands on the south shore of Long Island, those bays, those that's good fishing all summer. Because you can imagine you've got uh, cooler ocean water pouring right in from uh, through those inlets. Uh, so you've got a nice shallow bay fishery on that side. So there is quite a seasonal progression um, where you're going to have fish in the bays early on and then um, and including an interesting thing about those th south shore bays behind the barrier islands is they pretty much will have fluke from may until whenever they leave uh end of september or so um whereas between the forks no you only have the spring season and then they bail out of there but you know then from that point on starting right around now the ocean fishing um should get good when you when you're talking about these bays what is the depth like what what what, huh. what kind of areas and depths are these things hanging out well we, so peconic bay shelter island sounds so that's the water between the forks of, of long island that water can get to, to 90 feet wow. we and we do fish them as deep as like 70 um so that's that's pretty deep and what happens um i think one of the reasons they go in there is we also get some squid will go in there at that time of year, and that probably helps bring those fish in. Um, but yeah, it's kind of interesting. Like, why is it that once it gets a little past mid-June, those fish bail out of there, and then they're they're basically gone? I mean, you might catch little ones, but there's, there's really no fluke fishery during the summer in those bays. However, uh, in, in the ocean bays, the bays behind the Barrier Islands, Shinnecock Bay, Mauritius, all of that, uh, Great South Bay, those depths are generally shallow. Most of the fishing you do there is in less than 15 feet of water, and a lot of it's in five or six feet. Wow. What a massive difference. <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so you've been dialing that in for years and years and years. Decades, yeah. What What has it been like going down to Florida? Because I've seen you catch some some golf flounder, down in florida not big ones no. and you're not really targeting those more of a right I, I, right I catch those accidentally okay. um you know i'm, I'm looking you know I'm, I'm basically casting for redfish and snook and um you know I, I seem to find them the ones i've got were like you know we've got all these little islands in pine island sound and on the corners sometimes you get areas that are a little deeper where it's been scoured out by the current and deep is so relative you know when i say deep here, I mean, 90 feet. When I say deep in Florida, I mean five feet, you know, and, and it's not an, it's not a joke or an exaggeration. It's exactly what it is. I mean, if I go to a corner of one of those islands and there's four feet of water, that's deep because the rest of it's two feet or less. So a lot of times that's where I do when I, when I get them, that's usually where they are. I don't catch them on a, on a flat. They're usually when I'm casting and on some of those deeper scour, scoured out areas. And the best one I had was probably 17 inches. That was uh, that was by Everglades City. I was actually uh, bucktailing for a Goliath grouper in the channels from the kayak, and uh, and and caught a fluke in the caught a summer, yeah, caught a Gulf flounder, I suppose, in there. Yeah, they they can get big. I caught one 
a, a real a big one like that, you know, 17, 18 near where you are and, uh, you know, near like Boca Grande area. And it, it was right. We were we were fishing a mangrove line. It was a point where there's a lot of current ripping through. It was the right. deepest part. It was probably seven feet. Yeah, yeah. And I had an uh, Alabama leprechaun. <clears throat> I, I should have gone heavier, but I, I made a long cast and let it kind of just drip and sink down in there. And all of a sudden I was like, man, I thought it was a big snug. I'm going to pull up a monster flounder, uh, w- which is rare, uh, I'd say, on the Gulf Coast of Florida. Definitely get some big flounder. Jacksonville, St. Augustine, even in you know Sebastian Inlet. Uh, I mean, there's some legit flounder there for, uh, for Florida, Florida waters. Um, but you haven't really spent much time on that, that coast yet. No. And the, and the reason it, well, first of all, it's, you know, it's a long drive and there's just so many opportunities where I am. And, you know, this is, a, I've spent two and a half winters down there. So there's so much to learn and there, there's so many things that I, it, like, I want to go down to the keys, but I just can't seem to pull myself away from, you know, <laughs> going 10 minutes from the house and, you know, and, and fishing there. And that, that's kind of like the way I am too. You know, I, I try to thoroughly learn stuff that I can really put pressure on as opposed to making long trips. The exception is that I, I do make trips uh, down to like Everglades city, Chocolosky to uh, bucktail the, the Goliaths. And those are fun Goliaths. Those aren't the ones that are the size of a car. These are the like 10 to 30 pounders. And they're a heck of a lot of fun when they pounce on a jig on a, you know, on appropriate tackle. And um, so I, I go down for that. It reminds me of striper fishing because you're, you're drifting over rock structure, which, you know, I don't have by me and um, on the floor and, and, and some depth and current. So it's kind of like striper fishing. So I, I do that. But no, I haven't jumped over to the East Coast. Yeah. That's cool. So what, what are the main differences? Let's go back to the original question, I guess, on these different <clears throat> species. Do you, do you even, do you even know, do you even spend much time? Oh, I, so your the, fluke. <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't pay much attention because um, I know the ones up here are summer flounder and I know the ones I catch in Florida aren't. So that leaves Southern and <laughs> Gulf, but I do take note of the, of the spots and they don't match the spot pattern of the bottom fish there. Um, they match the spot pattern of one of those other guys because there are some prominent spots. So I have taken notice that, all right, you know, this fish has prominent spots and, um, you know, it's obviously not a, a summer flounder. So it's, it's a gulf flounder. Yeah, so it looks like this top one here, the, it has three spots connected almost via a triangle. And, uh, and this one has very prominent, you know, uh, one, two, three, four, five spots in a kind of a, I don't know, not a parallelogram. What do you, what do you even call that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was told there's yeah. going to be no math today on this yeah. podcast. <laughs> I, I, I've had enough of having to be really smart. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. I love it. All right, so we'll we'll pretend like we know what we're uh, talking. Probably about. a rhombus or something. We'll just a rhombus. Look at you know, that. Some some math person can come after us and Look and and flame us for that. Flame me for that. So, yeah. all right. So we'll we'll then go back to your neck of the woods. You talked about some of the migration patterns. Uh, I I'd like to hear a little bit more in terms of locations. And I think most people, if they haven't done much fluke fishing, you know, you see even a bay, right? It sounds simple. These bays are huge. And if you start talking about 60, 70, 90 feet depth, I mean, you obviously are relying heavily on electronics. Uh, Like, how how do you how do you pick your spots? And I know you have a ton probably marked over the decades. But if you were new or newer to it, how do you go out there without wasting a bazillion hours on the water how do you go out there and and kind of consistently find some good fluke spots okay and uh, let me um back off one second as i forgot to mention long island sound which is really kind of funny since probably you know time wise that's where the bulk of my fishing has been done over my lifetime so when i mentioned those fish getting out of peconic bay um and and fish coming in early they also go into long island sound now that you know that's a body of water that varies it can be as wide as 17 miles it's like anywhere from like 8 to 17 miles 
wide. It's a uh, hundred plus miles long. Um, and you know, depth can, you know, go well past a hundred feet. Um, so there's, there's that fishery, you know, I, cause I did mention the South shore bays, the water between the forks, the ocean, and I did not mention the sound. Um, that sound fishery used to be incredible. And the last couple of years has been really getting poor. But then I had a trip like, I don't know, 10 days ago where I had a dozen keepers on my own in the afternoon and had like 40 some odd fish. And, wow. you know, keeper for us is 18 and a half inches. That's a small keeper. Um, and, you know, these were all up to like 20, 21 inches. Um, so there, there is that fishery. But all right, getting back to what, what do I look for? No matter where it is, um, we, you know, we'll stick to bays and things like that. Um, you know, you're looking for areas of um, uh, slopes, slopes and ledges. I always say, well, fish love edges. You know, fluke really love edges. And you, you're almost always fishing a slope, fishing a contour line, looking for rips, eddies. Um, you know, you really, you want moving water on a, on a slope, you know, and, and that's the kind of thing. And, and you have to kind of figure out the depth, you know, you make your, your, your drifts and you, you try to find fish that way. Um, that's generally how you find them. Now in the shallower areas, you might get a little help, especially later in the season when there's bait around from, uh, the birds, the turns, you know, the, because they, you know, they'll be, uh, they could be marking bait. And a lot of times those sand, those, uh, fluke are on the sand eel. So that's something to look for as well. And what is, what is your go-to confidence lure? Has it changed? No, not since 20, <laughs> not since 2010. It's, um, yeah, it's a bucktail and gulp and then a, a teaser a foot above that. And that can be even a plain gamakatsu bait holder hook, like a three O or, you know, tsunami, um, glass minnow or something. The silicone skirt ones are good. And, and then it's the, you, you kind of like, if I'm fishing smaller waters, I'll fish a four inch gulp grub. And when we're fishing like Montauk block Island, we're fishing the ocean or even Peconic Bay, which is, you know, it's bigger, deeper water, bigger fish, hopefully, um, six inch gulp grub. But, um, you know, I haven't seen anything that, you know, is going to beat, beat that. And, and you know what, traditionally going back, you know, decades, this was a bait dragging fishery. And I've, I'd like to take credit for having converted many people from doing that to bouncing bucktails on lighter tackle. It's more productive. It's a lot more fun, you know, and in the long run, it's better for the fish because, you know, when you're dragging bait, anybody who has dragged bait for fluke knows you're pulling up quite a few of them where the only thing coming out of the mouth is the leader and that fish is gut hooked and when you're fishing bucktails and and teasers you know that's a active fishery you're jigging it you get a hit you set the hook so there's there's basically no gut hooking i mean it's very very rare yep. whereas in bait fishing it's extremely common so um yeah yeah and same here in florida right if you're sitting there with uh with live bait, it, it happens a whole lot more than using a slam shady or Alabama leprechaun where, you know, as soon as you feel that strike, you're, you're setting that hook. Yeah. Um, have we gotten you any power prawns yet? Have you, have you, uh, even had the chance? Cause I've seen uh, quite they're a few. Desk. They're actually, okay. if I reach back, I can probably get them. Um, so the, the times I use artificial shrimp, have our, our it's gulp you know so the three inch gulp shrimp have been a, a real you know winner for me and actually i really like using those in the south shore bays during the summer because the fluke there are often on um small crabs and, and shrimp and it's dark colored stuff so i put like a new penny three inch gulp shrimp on and and they really like that so i haven't tried you know the, i mean the power prawns again that's um, my experience using plastics, yes, you will catch some fluke, some, some flounder on plastics. My experience, sorry, Joe, but my experience is the gulp is going to, and I've put them up side by side. I, I did it with, with some salt strong stuff recently. Uh, you know, the gulp is not plastic. I don't know what it is. All I know is fish will eat it. You guys know that because you, you did that, uh, that video on how to catch pinfish, right? Oh, yeah. You can put little bits of gulp on on hooks and, and catch all the pinfish you want. It's crazy. Can you, can you yeah. put plastics on there and do that? No. At least yeah. you know, I haven't seen any success in, in doing that. 
On, on the flip side, some there are places in Florida where you cannot fish gulp because there's so many pinfish, blowfish, all these other things. You, you they devour devour it, and that, then you have to go to to something something yeah, else. It can get pretty expensive pretty fast. Oh no, it's a, junk yeah, fish, yeah. right? It's it, it can be yeah quite impossible. Well, we need to make sure at least to try it because I'm I'm more just curious because we've taken the power prawn with the Dr. Juice scent. So you are giving it some scent that does stick on there pretty well. And we're deep dropping this. And I mean, Luke was just out. He's caught Mahi, Cobia. Uh, he just went off Marco Island with a couple of friends. And they're like, they're laughing at him because they had bait. They had live bait and some cut bait. And they're all dropping down for, for big red grouper. And the power prawn, no lie, uh, not just saying this because we created it. I mean, it outfished all of them. Uh, and all his buddies just like, what the heck were you doing? And so, of course, they all bought some power prawns, and we're we're going out with uh, with our daddyo this uh, this coming weekend. Going out, you know, it's snapper season, and trying to just see if we can recreate it. It might not work, but so far it continues to work, even dropping it down forty to seventy feet. So I'm I'm more just curious if you put Doctor Juice, if it uh, if it's catching big fluke or not. Are you so, jigging that? Oh, yep. You must be jigging it, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. So what I would be curious, the test I want you to do, mm -hmm. so I want you to jig that with and without the scent and tell me how that works. Because, you know, are these reaction strikes to the... Because the, that's that's what the difference here is, you know. And, you know, I even see it to some extent with... Um, I, I catch... that That's... I hate to say that stupid little Fred lure you guys make. That is a... Oh, that is a wicked redfish lure, <laughs> yeah. you know. and. Um, <laughs> yeah so but you know and yet fish won't just eat a well, a fred laying on you know pinfish won't just eat a fred right. and and fluke oh i saw it you know i did try it recently and you know fluke did what they have done with every soft plastic i've put out there for them scented you know i've tried the pro cure smearing the stuff on there yeah you will catch some but if you do a side-by-side -side test I, you know, you don't get the results as you do with, with the fluke, but, um, I will definitely try the power prawns. Um, definitely put the Dr. Juice. So we did, we did yeah. one study in Caraval. We were going offshore, you know, we're in 60, 70 feet and we did do it with and without and with definitely caught more. Um, okay. one day it outperformed the cut. We had some like big pieces of, of, of chunky, you know, big old chunks, and the power prawn with Dr. Juice won the first day, and then day two, it did not. Uh, I still caught a lot of fish, but the just the big cut bait ended up outperforming it. So it's, it's, right. I love testing this stuff. It's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I'm into that kind of thing. And um, as you know, and, but again, you're jigging that thing. Oh, yeah. Just so that's, you know, to me, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's a motion thing. For example, the, so, it was funny, I, you know, I've, I'm just branching out around Pine Island, and the first time I went into Captiva Inlet, um, you know, I'm looking at it for the first time, and I thought to myself, wow, this is like, you know, Long Island Inlet. It's, it gets down to 40 feet. There's, you know, three knot current. This is like Mauritius. If I was there, I would, you know, I would like snap jig a, a, a bear. It's not a bear bucktail. It's just a bucktail with nothing on it. Yeah. It's, a, you know, a small ball head, olive color bucktail. and um, you know, there were guys obviously um, fishing bait, of course, because it's Florida, and uh, they were drifting through there catching uh, gags, um, not big ones, but, you know, this was April, so it's what was there. And um, they weren't really catching much, and I went in there with a bucktail, nothing on it, and <clears throat> every drift, every single, and I don't mean I had to wait. You know, you got it down there, a couple snaps, boom, you had a grouper, boom, you had it one after another after another. Um, I'm really anxious to try that when I go back in November, when I know that there, there's some better ones in there. Um, and you know, the difference was, yeah, the, a lot of fish, you know, they'll, they'll reaction strike and they want to see some motion. Yep. And, um, yeah, the, the, yeah, it's amazing how much bait fishing is done in Florida. It's just, it's not, it's, it's remarkable, which is why, that's why I like what you guys do so much because you, you know, you point out the wonderful fishing that's available on the artificials. And yeah, I, I bet, you know, your shrimp, um, you know, 
And I'm going to grab him. Now they're right. Cause as I'm talking, I said, I know they're right over here, you know? <laughs> so I've got to pull this bag out here. Here we go. Yeah. Which ones do you have? Is it um, the, they're the small. Ones? Okay. No, actually they're small. And those are the ones I would try out here because, um, yeah, they do look nice. Um, so that's like, uh, I guess a three, three and a half, four inch, something like that. Yeah. That's a, that's the three, seven, three point seven five or something. Okay. Like that, I yeah. Sure. See, and you guys are smart. You do things right here. You've got that slit in the, in the bottom so that you don't have to hook all the way through the thickness. Yeah. It's a lot of, of material. The, yeah. Of the, of the, yeah, because it's, you have no bite on the hook when you do that. So, um, all right. Yeah. I'm going to, you know what, when that fishery hasn't really kicked in for us yet, which is the South shore Bay fishery, that's just been kind of weak. But when I, um, when I get on that, that's a, something I do with the kayak. I'm going to bring these in the Dr. Juice. Yeah, I'm always up. I'm trying new things all the time. So well, that's, yeah. that's how we got turned on to that thing. It was in Chuck Kaleski, you'd mentioned earlier, and we were there with an insider and he's a Brazilian guy because that's all they use down there. So the Brazilians, like they think we're idiots, you know, in Florida for only using live bait and and they they take a similar looking type of shrimp and they have snook the riballo and that's all they use so right. you know here we have manufacturers like let's just take a bucktail there's everyone's making bucktails there everyone makes shrimp like that's uh -huh. that is the thing and we go off and we're scratching our head like what what are we doing and he's like just just watch <laughs> and you know we went off we went offshore we we hit it was a public wreck and he's like, all these wrecks near Chukaluski, you know, just 10 miles out, they all have, they all have snook on them. And, uh, and he's like, I found the best thing to do is just put it, it's basically a reaction strike, scent or no scent, you're just putting it down there, right in the structure and popping it. And lo and behold, I mean, we caught multiple 40 plus inch snook and, and we caught snook till we were like tired of catching snook. Wow. Nice. It was the craziest thing. And Luke and I were like, all right, if this works, in St. Pete, then we're on to something. So we took some back at work there and now it, it seems to work everywhere. It's uh, it's certainly our, even selling more than the Fred and Slam Shady, it's our top selling lure right now. And um, I, I'd ask you, cause someone in the community recently put a pretty big fluke uh, that they caught on the power pond. It was, uh, I mean, it, anything looks big to someone from Florida when you see a, you know, a, a, a 20 something inch uh, fluke, but, uh, it, it looked monstrous to me. And he's like, yeah, I caught on the power prawn and Dr. Juice. So keep yeah, up. So that, that technique you just said when he, that's what we call snap jigging. You know, you're, you, you, you really hard snap and you yep. watch, I'm sure as you know, you, you watch the line and make sure you see when it taps by and you snap it and, yep. and yeah. So that's, that's exactly what I was saying. I did in, in Captiva Inlet, but you know, uh, with a three quarter ounce bucktail with nothing on it. And, um, and yeah, you know, all these people with the bait are just kind of looking, you know, <laughs> so I, I'm really looking, looking forward to trying that uh, again. It's, um, yeah. Yeah. And who is this guy? Well, here to our space. Yeah. I mean, where's his bait? You know, <laughs> that's the, the bait thing I don't get down there because it's such a wonderful fishery that you have. And, uh, you know, over and over, you know, you just see. People, they pull up to the mangroves and they throw a whole bunch of live bait fish around and, you know, and it's not necessary. You know, as you know, you guys make a bunch of lures to, to, to catch them, catch them on. Yeah. That used to be us, I'm sorry to say. Well, hey, you know what? Uh, fluke, traditionally, um, I mean, 20 years ago, everybody dragged bait. Every fluke trip started with uh netting shiners or going to the bait store and yep. getting you know killies and squid and all this other junk and yeah and uh it's not it's not necessary yeah oh and just it gives you so much more control and freedom not to have i mean you can do it in a kayak you don't have to have oh, yeah. a live well anymore you, it, it, it saves so much time yes no it's 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 a wonderful thing yeah so yeah i promise to you know See, I do have them on my desk. It's not like they're sitting in a box somewhere. <laughs> um, so anything on my desk is, you know, there because it's it's going to get a shot soon. So, yeah, just waiting for those fish to 
to get alive in those South Shore bays. And then I'm going to get over there with my electric kayak. Hey, so one thing I didn't bring up is, um, and you know, you'll laugh because in Florida, everybody has a trolling motor, and see, that's not the case here. Um, but I've got to tell you, so much of my fishing now is assisted with a trolling motor, whether I'm on the kayak or in my boat. So much because with fluke fishing, you can make every drift perfect. So why wouldn't you do that? You know, and and I do, and and it makes such a big difference. Like if you're following a a contour line, you know, especially a curved contour line, yeah. um, it, it's just so easy to do with, with the trolling motor, and you don't care about wind blown against the current or anything like that. You go out whenever you want because you can make the drift that you want to make. And yeah, so trolling motor is absolute game changer for that kind of fishing. Yeah. So what, what is it just because of the type of boat? It's tough to mount on on a lot of the boats up north? No, they, no, no, no. My, well, it, it is definitely a little more challenging than, you know, sticking it on the front of a Maverick or something. But um, it's just not, it wasn't on their radar. Like when I got, um, in, in communication with Minn Kota about four years ago, I guess it is now, they to- they said to me that 80% of the boats that would benefit from a trolling motor in Florida have a trolling motor. But here, at that time, you almost never saw one, unless it was on a flat skiff that somebody was probably bringing back and forth. Uh, they, they've, they've definitely caught on and uh i fish on a couple of like 32 foot center consoles that have them and you know and they're great for like as you know anchor you know the spot lock feature is unbelievable you know for yeah. you know, when we fish for blackfish and stuff you know any kind of pinpoint anchoring any kind of anchoring uh but you know i've used it for like weak fish which you guys was kind of like your sea trout mm-hmm. and you know you get over a school and if there's no other boats drifting around you spot lock on the school and if the school moves a little, so you jiggle a little bit and, but you're right on the fish the whole time and, and you crush them. And, um, but w- with the fluke to be able to follow those slopes and stay on the, the productive parts at the right speed. Um, yeah, it, it, it's great. And we're seeing a lot more people doing it. That's cool. All right. So this, this summer you're going to be up there going after fluke. What's the plan? Do you go during certain moon phases or just depending on weather or... weather okay it's all weather it's been any kind of ocean fishing is entirely weather and you know any any day weather aside any day can can be good out there and we're not too worried about um you know the the moon phases for fluke um but it's just a matter of being able to get out because it's ocean waters and yeah yeah it gets rough so how, how far out well, it's actually not that far out. The the farther spots are about four to five miles off Long Island. Uh, it just happens to be that that's 35 miles from where we come out of. Um, <laughs> and uh, Block Island spots are like 45 miles, which is really, you know, yeah, I don't know. You may have noticed like the gas prices have gone up a little bit. So, oh, uh, yeah. So that's, um, you know, definitely. <laughs> got to give you pause for thought there about you know making these runs and with these twin engine center consoles uh so yeah but so you better you basically better catch fish when you go out there yeah well it's just one of those things you know you, you yeah it's it's what we do in the summer so when we get the conditions and and the fish are chewing we're, we're gonna go yeah what what do you do on tough days? It's a question that that we hear, and I'd love to hear what you say. Where it's just it's a grind. Do you do you stick with the plan and say, I know there's some fish here. We're just going to keep fishing in this, or do you slightly move, or do you completely move and say, all right, we're going four miles this way? Yes, yeah, so that's a great great question, and we see this especially. It's funny in the sound when you're on them, you're on them. And there's not a lot of variation in the bite. In the ocean, it's much, much different. For some reason, you know, Montauk, Block, any of that, um, they they feed in spurts. You get these like 90-minute spurts. Are they probably, you know, probably current-related? The thing about Montauk is it's not a very... It, the, the tides are very complex. You have a lot of collision of currents 
coming around Montauk Point and and you know it's not even that if you had them at nine o'clock yesterday you can think that they're going to be there at nine fifty today. Well, I have to say that our tides are very pro- much more consistent. Your tides are insane down there. <laughs> where you have like seventeen hour incoming tides. We don't have that here. It's six hours and fifteen minutes up, six hours and fifteen minutes down, roughly. So normally you can, you know, if you have a tide related bite, you add an hour roughly for the next day. And that's when the bite should be on the same yeah. tide thing. But okay, so getting back to the original question, um, what will happen is, you know, suppose we get we get some fish and it shuts down. This is where you have to have the discipline not to move because the fish are still there and you just have to, you know, unless, you know, it's a big question because we always have at least one guy in the boat who just wants to move, wants to move, is impatient. But the thing to do is to grind it out and wait for that bite. If you have caught fish in that where you're fishing and it shuts down, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to go chase a bite. So, I mean, look, if you get a cell phone call from somebody and says, hey, we're pounding them over here. Well, obviously. But if you're just guessing, you know, um, you, you're best off staying where you are, where you know those fish are, and wait for them to turn on again. But also, since they're there, you know they're there. Hey, maybe you're going to pick some. Maybe at least you will grind. You can go someplace else. And guess what? If the bite is off over there, you're not you're not even going to know where those fish are because you're not going to catch them. You're not going to be able to find them. Yep. We, we always go back to just, and this is inshore, obviously, where we have different things that we can look for. But it's it's the birds and the in the in the bait. You know, if if that's the first thing that we do when we're looking at a flat or a mangrove line, if we're even debating that, if it's been a struggle. If we're debating leaving, we're like, all right, let's just pause for a second and really look at this spot. Like, do we see a ton of mullet or not? And if the answer is no, mm-hmm. then we then we bolt. So that really is that that simple. A lot of people say, how do you decide? And Luke and I would say, we don't see mullet or we only see a couple. Let's just go. And let's just, let's agree not to even stop until we see either birds, not not diving, but like talked about egrets on, on a, a prior video. If we see some egrets or something along an oyster bar or a shoreline and we see mullet, then we're going to stop and fish. Okay, so let me ask you about, you know, yep. um, so with the mullet, you mean the big mullet, the big jumping mullet. Yep. Yeah, and those, are, I mean, obviously are not, the, the fish you're trying to catch are not eating those mullet. Right. Not necessarily. Okay. Not I necessarily. just wanted to make sure we're yeah. talking about the same the same mullet. And I, I agree with you. When I'm going along in the kayak and a couple hundred yards away, you know, I, I can see some mullet. Well, you can bet I'm going over there. Yeah, and, you know, especially redfish. You know, it's um, yeah, they're a great indicator for whatever reason. Probably they probably stir the bottom up. It's probably all it is. Yeah, they do. They're stirring up bottom and yeah. putting up all kinds of yeah. uh, little crustaceans out of the grass. Uh, but you'd be shocked because we have drone footage of this. I, I wish I had it handy. I could pull it up. But we found a spot in Tampa and there was mullet everywhere. I mean, the big ones you're talking, they're jumping and like, it was, it was just, there was life there. And so we put the drone up before we fished. We're like, it'd be cool just to see what this looks like. And we could maybe do a little, little educational video, which we're going to do on it. And you can see the schools of mullet, big schools. And then you see the schools of redfish right near them. Some of them are following them all, not eating them, but just following them for what you talked about. Right. But there's also a couple of really big snook, like loners. Like I'm talking 40 plus inches, oh. and they were going after the those big mullet, like the big, you know, that we call them hog legs. That you, we actually have a video. Of this snook is chasing down. I mean, it is trying to eat uh, these uh, these big mullets. So there there are some big snook in there, depending obviously where you are in Florida, that are going after those uh, those big mullet. It was That's really cool. really really cool yeah. to see it from, uh, yeah. from uh, above. Yeah, and so um, with with the drone, were you able to see that? Uh, real time because I have a lot of trouble. I, I just started playing with a drone, and the problem I have with the sunlight is trying to see. Um, you know, you're, you're in such shallow water, but yep. with the phone, it's hard to just see the video of what the drone's seeing. You know, yeah, that was you, trying. you can you can barely you, you can see that there's fish. You don't even know if it's mullet or really redfish. Oh, but these, you can these, see fish, though. That's oh yeah, hundred percent. You could see, but it's but tough because you are looking at your phone. You're like. Yeah. 
but I don't know what it is, but when we put it on a big screen, we're going to be see it pretty clearly. So Right. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. That's real consistent with what I figured it's going to have. And it's probably also you're in two feet of water probably or three no, two feet yep. probably yep. so yeah then then that's gonna work out yeah okay yep all right so the other thing he said i'd love to hear stories what's good story from florida up there uh doesn't have to be necessarily with fluke what's uh what's been a, a memorable memorable one uh this this year last year oh i'll, I'll tell you what all right i'm gonna i'll give you one um <laughs> It would I mean because it's it's always the stuff that's fresh, it's fresh in your mind. Yeah. Um, oh, you know what? Maybe I'm going to use one from the from last summer because that was pretty outstanding. Um, so I know you got a lot of sharks down there. We do not have them. I mean, I grew up on Long Island Sound, and we basically, um, you know, don't have sharks. I'd never seen one. Um, and then a couple summers ago. Uh, a couple were showing up on the shore and actually I, I did get one at, at night. And, uh, but then last year, you know, I hadn't seen them in a while. Um, I was pencil popping for stripers and lo and behold, I see this tail and dorsal come up behind the pencil. And I knew from Florida, you know, I was talking to people, they say, Hey, they don't have good eyesight. You really gotta give it, you know, let them, you know, get to it. So, I went, I stopped the retrieve based on that Florida knowledge. And wouldn't you know that tail goes whipping around and he grabbed that pencil popper and it was off to the races. And I knew, you know, I got it on video and I knew exactly what it was I was dealing with. And that thing took off and, uh, a run like you wouldn't believe. And he almost emptied the spool and the hooks pulled. So it was perfect. I got the plug back. That's great. And, and, but see, then I, it was a, a trip where I plugged, but then was going to throw live eels for stripers. So then I switched over um, when it got dark. Cause that's what you do. When it gets dark, you'll switch over to live eels. And um, yeah, when I switched over to live eels, I, I actually then hooked and landed a shark on my nine foot surf rod. And so that was like just, you know, a couple throughout all my life, this was an impossibility. You know, there couldn't possibly be sharks in the sound like that, but they were, you know, for whatever reason, things change, right? I'm sure you guys have fisheries there that used to exist that don't exist anymore. And um, maybe you don't, you know, the migrations are different, but, you know, then there's fisheries that you didn't used to have that you have now. I mean, we have that kind of thing here and certainly, you know, sharks showing up and, you know, hitting a pencil popper, uh, uh, that was, that was insane. So, yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. What, what's, what's been your favorite down in Florida? What species to target? I guess, I guess it's gotta be, it's gotta be tarpon, even though I, I don't do a lot of it because I get out of there in the first week of May and, you know, it takes a few days to pack. So pretty much May is off the table. So I have to do it in, in April. And there's certainly nothing like booking a tarpon. Yeah. And, um, and that's just, it's uh, the, I mean, you hook a fish that jumps nine or 10 times and, and so high in the air and it's such a big, <laughs> how can you beat that? What? Nothing beats that, you know? So yeah, it, it's gotta be that. But between the snook and the redfish, boy, you know, I, I know, I, you know, I, I appreciate the snook and everything, but I, I appreciate the redfish just as much. There's something about fishing for those. I don't know what it is because um, they don't have the acrobatics of, of a snook. And at least the ones that we get in Pine Island Sound don't reach the size of the of the bigger snook that we get. But, um, you know, but it's yeah, it, it would be the tarpon. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, the tarpon, everyone says, that. why don't you guys do more tarpon stuff? And usually once a year we do. And in the small ones, they're fun. You can catch them all day long. But when you get a big one, like 125 or more, yeah. you only want to catch one a year. Like it, <laughs> it, and the older you get, it just, it hurts your, every, it hurts everything. Um, Cause those, those fish fight to the death. And if you, you land one, it could be 35, 40 minutes, an hour later, uh, you know, depending on the depth that you're in and uh, oh man. Every time I catch a big one, I'm like, I do not want to do that again. <laughs> uh, but it is, it's just, it's something about the heart races. When you see that thing, when you know it's on lines, just screaming out and they make that first jump. It is, it is so cool. Right. There's, there's nothing like it. Yeah. Yep. 
That's excellent. Well, where can everyone go learn more? I know we uh, we're all over the place. This was a fun fun conversation on um, on Fluke. You've got your Fluke Mastery, and, the, and it's you know I get a report every month of everything that that's sold. Just so we're always looking for trends on uh, on you know what's selling because we have twenty eight different courses I believe now, and uh, every month I I see your courses on there. Uh, there's people buying them. It seems like every day. Yeah, I, I see that too. It's a nice, steady flow. And you know what? It, it's, um, it's yeah, you know, my, my books do the same. So yeah, I've got the course. Uh, I've got the Fishing for Summer Flounder book. And, um, and, and you know what? Anything that has the word bucktail in it with me is going to yeah. also be useful for fluke. I have the, you know, the fluke, the bucktail course and the bucktail book and yeah, all that stuff relevant yeah. information yeah and the bucktail one was neat too because you you do cover using the bucktail even in florida absolutely and um you know right. catching 11 species uh it, it nuts how versatile that oh uh, bucktail oh, is absolutely absolutely yeah second yeah. only to the power phone of course okay all right well like they, like i said they, they are <laughs> on my desk so they're uh you know they are destined to you know to get used as soon as i get that as soon as that fishery gets going, yeah. Cool. Let us know and, and definitely do it with or without the Dr. Juice. We 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 love experiments like that. So okay. Keep us posted. All right. all right, but what what is what's the best websites to get all your stuff? Um we got salt strong slash skinner. I know it's the one yeah, on the site. Yeah, yeah, it's it's that one and uh, flounderbook.com. That will uh, get you over to the fluke book and yeah. Perfect. Books are on Amazon too as well. Yeah, and they're they're excellent. The courses are excellent, and love love seeing all the the comments and the feedback that continues to come. Right, out. I answer so. I answer every single one of those comments, and if somebody puts up a comment and I don't answer, they need to come after me. But I I you know I really make sure I answer every one of those. Yep, absolutely. Well, John, it's a pleasure, my friend, and uh, we we definitely need to get together when you get back. And I know we say that every with I know we definitely have to do that. Yeah, we definitely need to do that. Well, we're going to make it happen this time. We just got to put a date down and both of us get some content out of it and it uh, should be fun. All right. Sounds good. All right. I'm a friend. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks for having me. Stay cool down there. Oh, we're going to try. All right. <laughs> See you, John. Cause fishing, it's in my soul.